on May 7th, Apple had an iPad event where they released new iPads. And initially I wasn't that interested, but lately I've been dealing with a lot of e-ink tablets. And so I took down some information I thought was interesting. And I found a couple little tidbits online that I thought was interesting as well. And just put them all together and going to share those with you today. All right, let's get into it. Welcome back to the channel, Roger for Rants About Tech. And I took a couple notes here, like I said, that I'm going to share with you that I thought were interesting about the event. Uh, first off, they did release uh, two new iPad variants, the new iPad Air and the new iPad Pros. Um, the Airs start out at $599. The Pros, the more interesting of the two, start out at $999. So, and that Pro version is touted as being the thinnest product Apple has ever released at 5.1 millimeters. And I gotta say, I haven't seen it personally, but you know, just going off the pictures and from what everyone is talking about online, it seems incredibly thin, like something you really have to see. So I'm gonna definitely make my way to Apple Store pretty soon to check out one of those. Actually, they won't be out till next month. So you can pre-order them now, but they're not shipping until next month. Um, one of the biggest things about this new release is the addition of the M4 chip in these new iPads, which is a puzzling question to me because I'm just wondering why they would release a new M series chip inside of a new iPad. Like you typically see a new M series chip in a new MacBook Pro, um, new Mac of some kind, but not the iPad. So that's a curious addition right there. But I'm sure welcome to everybody who's going to pick one up. Um, the Ultra Retina XDR display, which was described as being two stacked uh, retina displays, essentially, um, just to boost the brightness of the displays and to deepen the contrast between the blacks and the colors. There's supposed to be a sustained screen brightness of a thousand nits, which is pretty insane. I don't know if that's going to hold up in sunlight like e-ink does, which is what I'm really concerned about. Um, I hate to bring all this back to e-ink, but it's a pretty interesting development that you can do that and increase brightness beyond what a regular panel would produce. So I'm super interested if someone's going to get this and take it out in the sunlight and report on how bright these screens are, whether you can actually see it in the sunlight better than what we've previously been able to do with iPads because right now they suck in direct sunlight. But e-ink, superb. Next we have a nano etch technology which I thought was one of the coolest things too and especially since I'm getting in more into these e-ink devices who they all have some kind of film on them that helps you uh, with the friction of writing on a artificial piece of paper or artificial surface essentially. So it creates some kind of friction for the pen that you're using and it cuts down on glare as well. But um, there's a couple you know, problems with that compared to what these e-ink tablets are doing, which are basically putting uh, screen savers over these uh, glass screens and these glass devices. And that screen saver creates that friction. Apple has just decided that they would make the friction or bake the friction right into the glass that's protecting the LCD. So I think that's super cool. I mean, that cuts down on the distance between what you're writing with and what is displaying what you're writing. And that just adds to the the illusion of writing on something and it being coming from what you're writing with. So all of that's fine and dandy and I like that approach. And I, I want to see some of these e-ink devices kind of adopt that into their a plan that would be very cool, especially since one of the themes of e-ink is trying to lessen the gap between the instrument that you're writing with and the surface that the ink is showing up on. You want that to be as minimal as possible. So, you know, what better way to add a little friction to the surface to make it more like paper instead of laying a layer of screen protector on that's adding that that friction for you. Um, it would be super cool to see that. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. And in some ink devices like the Super Note that I have right here, their screen is a cushiony. It has it get, has some give to it. So the the tip of the pen kind of sinks down into the surface. It's not super noticeable, but it is there. And that's not something you can recreate with nano tech or nano etched glass. All right. So moving on to the next thing we have here. One more thing about the etched screen is that 
uh, you can only get this etched screen on the more expensive versions of the iPad Pro, which is the above $2,000 mark iPad Pros. So if you get a one terabyte or a two terabyte iPad Pro, uh, those versions can give you the option to pay for the etched screen. They don't come with it as an option freely. Um, you have the option then if you've bought one of those versions of the iPad Pro to then say, yes, I'll pay an extra $100 for that screen to be etched. So there you go. We have a new pen with rotation and squeeze where you can squeeze the pen and it be an actuating button essentially. So it, it could pull up maybe an eraser if you squeeze it. It could pull up some brush menu, some brush uh, options, which is what they showed in the presentation. I think that's a very cool way to get rid of a button by making the essentially a haptic feedback pen. Um, and it does have a motor in the tip as well. So this new pen is super, super cool. Another thing it does is it, it rotates uh, the brush style. So if you have a flat brush, you can rotate the barrel and it will rotate the brush, whether it's a uh, the wide edge of the brush or the thin, you can rotate it over to the thin edge of the brush and make a thin line. So that's super cool. I have a tidbit of, about that too later on in the video. Some super cool information I found out about that situation. Um, a new Magic Keyboard. Um, it's a keyboard. We'll move on. <laughs> also, they brought up this multi-cam recording situation that you can take some iPhones and connect them to the new iPad and have it like live produce a show where you can switch between the cameras on the fly and add clips and stuff in. It was wild. Um, a lot of people were looking at that thinking, why would you spend so much money on four iPhones? Because I think you can connect up to four iPhones. On four iPhones and the new iPad that's you know over $3,000 or whatever the case may be. And I'm just thinking to myself, I don't think anyone will go out and buy this just for that feature. But it doesn't hurt if you already got iPhones and you have the new iPad. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's just an added bonus. Like, hey, I got this stuff and I want to do this thing and it can do that thing. So let's do it. I can see a lot of use cases where having four iPhones recording something and being that being sent to an iPad live and you being able to manipulate the production right there on the fly, like, some, like a really cool multi-cam live stream uh, done with iPhones and iPads, like that's wild. I wouldn't mind seeing that, to be honest with you, to see how that actually works out. So, you know, it's another thing. I think that the single most important upgrade to this iPad for it being an iPad, right, um, would be the movement of the FaceTime camera and speakers. I mean, it was so silly to have your camera in portrait mode knowing no one uses it that way when they're trying to have a call. It's usually in landscape. It's just, I don't know. I'm super happy that they moved that uh, to a landscape orientation and they moved the speakers to the bottom of the iPad so it's better suited in a landscape situation as well. It just, that probably was the biggest thing of the whole event for me and probably a whole bunch of iPad users that just don't know it yet. <laughs> but that's the only thing you're really gonna get out of this, the newness of this iPad right here other than power. But like I said, it's got way more, it had way more power than it could have used last generation. This just added to that conundrum. But there are a couple things that the people over at Apple Track or the guy over at Apple Track pointed out that I liked. He had a super cool video on the M4 iPad release and he brought up a couple things that I thought was super interesting because it kind of relates to something I said in a video I released uh, about a month ago on the MacBook Pro. I just recently bought uh, one of the new MacBook Pros, the M3. I got the M3 Max and luckily I got the M3 Max because the M3, M3 Pro chip um, for the new MacBook Pros or the latest generation, they have a reduction in the amount of bandwidth they have on their chipsets. So the data transfer rate for the M2 Pro chip was 200 gigabits a second. The 
data transfer rate for the M3 Pro chip, which you would think would be at least as fast, took a 50 gigabit a second hit at 150 gigabits a second transfer rates. Um, and that's just confusing. Like why would the, the newer device transfer data slower than the older device? It just didn't make sense. And that wasn't the only area it took a hit. The new MacBook Pro M3 Pro chips also took a hit in the processing core department. So I'm not sure exactly how many processing cores they are down, but at least two cores. It's just a confusing situation where Apple is taking away features and faster hardware in favor of what? I think size, you know, but who can say? But that's the same thing that was brought up about the new iPads where they're taking away hardware like they have one less camera in the new iPad Pro, um, one less microphone in the new iPad Pro. Uh, the 5G in the new iPad Pro is slower than the 5G in the older version of the iPad Pro. So it's just confusing to see Apple taking away features and hardware from the newer product that the older product had. It just, the older product is now faster than the newer one <laughs> in some situations. Well, maybe they did these things and took out these things because they wanted to make it as thin as possible. And from, like I said earlier in the video, it is the thinnest product Apple has ever made. So maybe those are the sacrifices you need to make to make the smallest product you've ever made. Definitely confusing though. So on to some controversy about the Apple pen, which I think is very nice. Um, the barrel rotation feature is something that was brought to my attention was being discontinued with the Wacom pens. So recently it was reported by Robert Revels over at his channel that Wacom is or has discontinued the Wacom art like stylus that they have been selling for at least a decade. Um, and this particular pen has that barrel rotation feature. So I'm thinking that maybe they discontinued it because Apple was coming out with theirs and maybe Apple contacted them like, hey, we want to use that technology and maybe they're licensing it from Wacom and Wacom has just stopped selling theirs to not have competition with Apple. Um, I don't know that to be true. That's just me speculating, but it's very curious that Wacom would discontinue one of their best selling, most useful pens for artists without a replacement. Like it discontinued it without a newer version or anything. They just like, there's no other pen in the Wacom lineup that has that barrel rotation feature right now, which is super curious. But like I said, that's just my brain thinking. You take it from it whether you will. All right, that's gonna be it for me. Those are the, my biggest takeaways from that event and the things that I started thinking and because I researched way too much, some other tidbits came up that I thought correlated and made sense but thanks for watching stay tuned for more content like the video if you liked subscribe if you want to see more and uh i'll see you on the next one take care